By the start of 1965, Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel had already broken up twice. Their debut album, Wednesday Morning 3am, was a commercial failure. Simon had headed off to England to join their folk music scene, while Art Garfunkel returned to Columbia University to finish his graduate work in math. However, by the year's end, the duo's failure had turned into one of the decade's biggest hits. Remixed to join the emerging folk rock movement, The Sound of Silence captured the hearts of a generation of young people, blending folk harmonies and lyrical beauty with the 60s jangly rock of the decade's end. The song also introduced the world to the songwriting of Paul Simon, who would become one of the most important voices in American popular music for decades to come. In restless dreams I walked alone Hello there, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvellously well. Welcome back to another episode of the series. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you're into production, you can go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. Paul Simon grew up in Forest Hills, Queens, New York, only a few blocks from his future performing partner, Art Garfunkel. The pair knew each other from elementary and middle school, and by high school, they were performing together under the name Tom and Jerry. Modeling their style and harmonies on the popular Everly Brothers, the duo had a minor hit with the song Hey School Girl in 1957. Hey, girl in row. The song hit the top 50 and the young 15-year-olds even performed on American Bandstand. Despite this early and promising start, the pair did not find immediate success as performers in the music industry. Garfunkel recalled, We got a quick education in the record business, but I left and went to college. I was the kid who was going to find some way to make a decent living. While Garfunkel headed off to Columbia, Simon headed to Queen's College, where he studied English and continued to write songs. He also befriended another young songwriter and Queen's student, Carol King. Although they never wrote together, they did record demos together as Queen's students. King recalled in her memoir, When I entered Queen's College in the fall of 1958, I had no idea that Art Garfunkel and Paul Simon were anything other than fellow freshmen until I saw their photo in a magazine with a caption identifying Artie as Tom and Paul as Jerry. Paul and I soon became friends. Among the things we had in common were a similarity of age and a desire to stay involved in writing and recording popular music. Hoping to earn some extra cash, we began making demos together as the cousins. Paul played bass and guitar, I played piano, and we both sang. Some songs were his, some were mine, and some were written by other people. The income was negligible, but we would have done it for nothing. While Carol's songwriting career with her then-husband Jerry Goffin took off, Paul worked various jobs with music publishers during the Brill-building era of the early 1960s. Like Many teenage rock and roll fans of the 50s who headed off to college, both Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel found themselves pulled towards folk music at the start of the 60s. Simon recalled, The early 60s were a very bad time. Around that time, I was 18 or 19, and the music was lousy, so I started looking for other areas, and I settled for folk. It touched me more. The pair reconnected, and by 1962, they were consistently working together again this time honing their skills in the arena of folk music and performing under their real names, Simon and Garfunkel. Simon and Garfunkel were folkies, and their first hit was written in a soft folk ballad context. However, it wasn't until they were unexpectedly reconnected with their rock and roll roots that this ballad became the transformative and iconic classic that we now know and love, The Sound of Silence. In an interview with Uncut, Simon recalled the experience of writing his iconic track. I wrote it in the bathroom in my parents' house because the room was tiled, so there was an echo. I used to turn the lights off and leave the water running. It was like white noise, you know. My brother says it was amazing that I wrote it because everything I'd written before that was way below it in quality. It was a step up. It was probably one of those things that when you're in some kind of serotonin dopamine flow and it just comes out but I was too young to know that those things happened. So I just took it as is. That's a good one. I could close my act with this one. Simon and Garfunkel were singing it locally and had perfected its haunting harmonies when the songwriter brought the song to Columbia producer Tom Wilson. Wilson would become known for his extensive work with Bob Dylan in the 60s, which he had just started around that same time. 
Wilson was interested in using The Sound of Silence for the group The Pilgrims before hearing Simon and Garfunkel sing it as a duet. Simon explained to Wilson that they had refined the arrangement for two people and asked if he and Garfunkel could show him their performance. So, Artie and I go up there and sing The Sound of Silence. We sang it, and to our surprise, they signed us. The result was the pair's debut album, Wednesday Morning, 3 a.m., recorded at Columbia Studios in New York City. The album was produced by Wilson and engineered by Roy Haley. The album was released in October of 1964 and marketed as exciting new sounds in the folk tradition. In addition to the original release, The Sound of Silence, the album features an eclectic range of influences, from a cover of Dylan's Times They Are Changing to an arrangement of the Benedictus from Orlando de Lasso's Misa Octavi Toni, a 16th century setting of the Latin Mass. The album was initially a flop, lost in the sea of Beatlemania. Simon headed off to England, where Garfunkel returned to his graduate work at Columbia University. However, in 1965, Wilson heard about a Boston-area DJ at WBZ-FM, who began consistently playing The Sound of Silence on Wednesday mornings at 3 a.m. Despite the early slot, the song began to gain popularity with Cambridge College students and then spread out to other FM stations along the East Coast. Wanting to build on the moment, Wilson went back to the original record and re-listened to the track. It was still great, but it was very soft, especially to be a hit. He went back into the studio and brought in some of the musicians who had just worked with Dylan for Like a Rolling Stone. Bobby Gregg on drums, Al Gorgoni on guitar, and Bob Bushnell on bass. So what's exciting about this is if we just solo Art and Paul, and Paul's acoustic guitar is bleeding into his vocals, so I'm assuming that that song recorded at the same time. If we just solo those elements of Paul with his acoustic guitar and Art, we'll get what the original release was. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Which, of course, is beautiful. In restless dreams, I walked alone. Now, Let's listen to Art on his own. In restless dreams, I walked alone. To me, that sounds like two guys sitting fairly close proximity. One's playing acoustic guitar, they're both singing at the same time. I mean, listen to Paul's. In restless dreams I walked alone. Yeah. I almost guarantee that's vocal mic here, acoustic guitar mic, because the bleed into Art's vocal mic is just too extreme for it not to have been done live together. And when you've got two people who are singing um, close harmonies together, like John and Paul did, where they had a U48, so it was in figure of eight on John's on one side and Paul's the other. They are interacting off each other. I personally have experienced trying to record people that sing in harmonies together separately, and it never sounds as good. There is something about the proximity and the kind of the air movement, facial expressions, you name it, whatever it is that these singers will get from each other by sharing that same space. In restless dreams I walked alone Yeah, the acoustic guitar bleeds too much. That's not a headphone. That's in the room. Both of them together. Neither playing the acoustic guitar and singing day. together. See, my Gen X age group, we all remember this because there was a massive Simon and Garfunkel resurgence in the late 70s and early 80s. And their Greatest Hits album was massive, absolutely massive. And of course, they went off and played Central Park a few years later, and it just like solidified the whole thing together where they got back together. Absolutely superb. So that would have been the original recording, what you just heard there. Again, all performed together in a room. You hear that little drum bleed. What I love about the drums. So there's bass bleed in the drums, but there's more low end on the actual bass track itself, and the electric guitar is bleeding in as well. I mean, it's three people got together in a room, pair of headphones on, listening to this track and playing to it. Pretty amazing. 
So let's go over to our dear friend, Professor Caitlin Carlos, who will talk about the folk rock revolution that happened in 1965. In the United States, we can trace the beginning of folk rock to the mid-60s. Certainly, Bob Dylan's electrified performance at the 1965 Newport Folk Festival is one of the key moments of this shift. The folk legend who had given the world blowing in the wind and the times they are changing famously traded his acoustic guitar and harmonica for a Fender Stratocaster. That same year, the Birds released their cover of Dylan's Mr. Tambourine Man, combining Dylan's folk songs with the sounds most associated at the time with the jangly rock guitar of George Harrison and the Beatles. In many ways, this was a completely natural progression. Musicians like Dylan and the members of the Birds, like many of their college-age fans, had turned to folk music at the start of the 60s, when so much of the pop music was directed towards a teen audience. Folk music gave them something to care about. It gave them words and meanings that mattered to them. However, when they themselves had been teenagers, they had been listening to and playing early rock and roll. Thus, the shift to folk rock brings together all of their influences and experiences up until this point. Likewise, Simon and Garfunkel's progression happened in much of the same way. From teen, rock, pop, to folk, and with a little help from producer Tom Wilson, they jumped directly into the sea of folk rock at exactly the right time, in 1965. When the album was re-released by Wilson in 1965, there was also a tiny shift in the song's title. Most of us know the song as the sound of silence, in the singular. But the very first release of the song on Wednesday morning, 3 a.m., lists the song as plural, the sounds of silence. People like to tell the story of the re-release as the origins of the singular version of the title. But it's a little more complicated than that. Going back to the lackluster reception of Wednesday morning, 3 a.m., while Art Garfunkel went back to graduate school, Paul Simon headed to England to participate in the folk music scene there. While in England, Simon recorded his Paul Simon songbook. And touch the sound of silence which was released there in August of 1965. This album featured solo versions of two songs from the Wednesday morning 3 a.m. album, He Was My Brother and The Sound of Silence. This looks like it may actually have been the first time we see Sound of Silence listed in the singular. However, since Wilson released the folk rock version of the song without Simon knowing, he would have had no say in the choice to change the title at that point. While this may have been a coincidence, perhaps more likely it is an indication that the song was always intended to be titled The Sound of Silence and had somehow gotten pluralized in the first release. Not only did the producer Wilson not tell Simon or Garfunkel that he had added additional production to the record, he also didn't tell them that he had re-released it in September of 1965. When Simon found out, he was completely surprised. Simon had a habit of picking up a copy of Billboard every week, and even when he was in Europe, he kept it up. In September, he was in Denmark when opening his copy of Billboard to see The Sound of Silence at number 86. He then bought a copy of Cashbox to verify and saw the same thing. Back in England, he got a call from Garfunkel, who excitedly explained the phenomenon in the States. They had a hit. The Sound of Silence hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 on January the 1st, 1966. The hit brought Simon and Garfunkel back together and they became two of the most important musicians of the second half of the 60s, releasing a string of hits including Mrs. Robinson, and the soundtrack of the film The Graduate, as well as their final release together, Bridge Over Troubled Waters, in 1970. The Sound of Silence was the perfect song at the right moment. It brought together the folk movement of the early 60s with the 50s rock and roll roots that had inspired most of their childhoods. After the breakup of the partnership, Paul Simon continued his career as one of the most important songwriters of the following decades. He has won 16 Grammys and in 1982 was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Simon and Garfunkel were inducted as a partnership into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1990, and in 2001, Paul Simon was inducted again as an individual. 
His accolades don't stop there. He received the Kennedy Center Honors in 2002, the Polar Music Prize in 2012, and in 2007, Paul Simon was the inaugural recipient of the Gershwin Prize for Popular Song by the Library of Congress for his contributions to American music. So I mentioned this a little earlier, Simon and Garfunkel for my age group is huge because when we were little kids, uh, Gen Xers in, in Europe, Simon and Garfunkel had a massive resurgence, absolutely enormous, which of course led up to that amazing concert in Central Park, which I'm sure many of you have heard and watched. Maybe even some of you went to go and see it. I couldn't, I was in a little village in England and a little bit too young. But Simon and Garfunkel are an institution for us. Bridge Over Troubled Waters, Sound of Silence, Mrs. Robinson, all of those songs are unbelievable. One of the few acts that my father had albums of when we were little kids. It was mainly, as I've said many times before, classical music and jazz, but just these handful of things. One Dylan album, a couple of Simon and Garfunkels, a Joni Mitchell. I mean, there was outside of jazz and blues and classical music, just a handful of things that were allowed in my house that were more rock or folk. And Simon and Garfunkel was one of those things. Paul Simon is one of the greatest songwriters that ever lived. His influence cannot be understated. And the magic that he created with Art Garfunkel is second to none. Their harmonies are legendary, absolutely beautiful. It's lovely to see the reference from the Everly Brothers. But for me, emotionally, they went even further. I can completely understand how reverential we are for the Everly Brothers and we they deserve so much praise. But Simon and Garfunkel, I don't know, there were so many things they said. They are a sound of the 60s for me. They stand right up there with Beatles, Stones, you know, The Doors and Simon and Garfunkel. If you take those four from a rock and roll aspect, pretty much sum it up. Of course, you can throw in the birds and the kinks. and I know, there's a hundred other bands we can put in there, but you get my point. Thanks ever so much for watching. Please leave any comments and questions below. I would really appreciate any suggestions you have on future artists or songs or bands, obviously, albums, you name it. Hey, record labels, genres, we love doing it all. Thanks everyone. So long, farewell, au revoir, adios, tot scenes, goodbye, ciao, au revoir.